forgot to print out the lab for Thursday. Well, I shouldn't say I forgot to print out the lab for Thursday. I printed out the lab for Thursday. However, I did not go over to the printer and actually pick up the lab for Thursday on amino acids and proteins. So what I will do is, for those of you in Todd's micro class, I'll just have it by then because I'll have walked over there and back. Brittany, I don't know. What? Well, I have to go back here for I was going to say, have, what time is 1.12? Not right after this, so Maybe I'll get it to you by then, because I have to, I can go over there and just drop it off for t in Todd's class or something. Yeah, but I wasn't planning on going back there, coming back here, and then like that. So anyway, I'll get it to you, Brittany, and Jasmine will worry about Jasmine later, because she's not in micro, is she? OK, so we're starting in on chapter 30 on enzymes. And I predict that this lecture will take Wednesday and Monday to finish, which puts us as having a test probably on Thursday next week. That's kind of what I'm aiming at. You wanted what? Well, we kind of went slower through some stuff than I thought I would go through, and so we'll do this. So chapter 30 on enzymes, I like, you know, this is the first, this is, most of our tests we've been doing two chapters, this one we're doing three, and part of it is because there's just not as much material in each of these chapters necessarily, and part of it is that enzymes are the natural or logical extension of the amino acids and protein chapters, because all amino acids are made up of, are our proteins, and proteins are made up of amino acids. So probably the number one reason we study enzymes is because they are truly essential for life. Or at least what we would kind of label as life. And we could probably say the same thing for molecules like carbohydrates, for molecules like lipids, and for molecules like amino acids. But I would say that this one is, I don't know if you want to say like extra essential for life, because I can imagine you could have life without glucose, without carbohydrates, because carbohydrates are primarily a source of energy in the body. Yeah, they have other uses, but we also have two other sources of energy. Your body can get energy from fats, and your body can even get energy from proteins. It's not as efficient, though. And I can imagine life without um, Lipids, maybe. That one's a little tougher because they do make the biological membranes that we have. But I could also see those being made up of, you know, proteins and things like that that would serve the same function. Because, you know, much of the cell membrane is actually proteins. And so I could actually see that occurring without it, without, you know, fats. And would life be possible without amino acids? Probably not. But the reason is because amino acids make proteins, and proteins are what makes enzymes. And the reason why enzymes are essential for life is that they speed up chemical reactions, or maybe we should say they speed up biological reactions. So notice that sort of when I say chemical reactions versus biological reactions, I mean, they're all chemical reactions. But we're kind of saying that we'll call them biological reactions if they occur in a living organism, and we'll call them chemical reactions if it's something that we can go and do in our beaker. And they can speed them up on the order of one to 100 million times. And so the reason they're essential for life is that if we weren't doing these things hundreds of millions of times a second, then you know life wouldn't be possible as we know it. It would be really, really slow. You could think about it maybe as, you know, if you, gosh, you guys probably don't remember record players where you could change the speed the record played at, so it would talk, you know, things like that. And so you can imagine life going at a slower pace, but it kind of might not be exactly what we expect it to be. So they speed up reactions 1 to 100 million times. Just to give you an idea of how good that is, so say you did two hours of homework. If I add a catalyst to that, you can do your homework in a thousandth of a second. Could you imagine that? Bam, homework done. So if I can invent a homework catalyst, I will do that, and I will make a bajillion dollars selling it. But I don't think it's really possible. Or another example is this, is if we take sugar. Sugar will spontaneously break down as a carbohydrate into smaller molecules. And that's fine, you know. But have you ever seen a bowl of sugar go bad? 
I mean, and when I say go bad, I don't mean like growing other things, but you know, like really spontaneously breaking down into other chemicals. No, but our body is constantly ingesting sugar, carbohydrates, and various things like that, and breaking it down and using it for an energy source. And the reason we can do that is because we have catalysts in our body that speed up the breakdown of sugar. Another reason that they're essential for life is they make reactions occur at room temperature and in neutral pHs. So reactions occur at approximately room temperature and neutral pH. You know, in general, it's actually slightly uh, acidic. And when we say room temperature, you know, that means body temperature, essentially. And reactions can occur at other temperatures and pHs in your body, too, uh, especially like things that occur in your stomach, where it's got a highly acidic environment. And, you know, that's where if you compare chemistry, say, versus biology, you know, this is room temperature and neutral pH. What you'll find if you notice what we've been doing in lab lately is we always have to add acid or base. For instance, when I was writing up the amino acid lab uh, the last couple days, one of the things I noticed is that every single reaction has nitric acid or hydrochloric acid or some acid present in order to speed up the reaction. And about 90% of the time, we boil them. And so we don't do things at room temperature. We try to heat them up to speed up the chemical reaction. And I guess if I'm kind of going side to side, I kind of did them out of order. But the idea is that compared to the body, we have to add a lot of extra energy or we have to have very acidic or basic conditions, whereas doing them in a living organism with enzymes means room temperature and neutral pH. So that's an advantage of them. Another thing that we find out about enzymes is they're very specific. Meaning it generally is one enzyme catalyzes one reaction. And an example of that that we've kind of seen, not necessarily using enzymes, but because we didn't focus on it at that point, but for instance, the difference between alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds versus beta-1-4 glycosidic bonds. That was the difference between starch and cellulose. And because we possess the enzyme, this is good for us, good for humans. And technically because, and really cows don't contain it, but, and uh, termites themselves don't contain it, but the bacteria in their guts contain it, this is good for horses. Good for cows and termites. And that's because they have gut bacteria that have that enzyme. And so, you know, that was an example from our carbohydrate chapter, but that also shows you that one enzyme does one task in the body generally. And that specificity is good in some cases because it allows us to, you know, very clearly control chemical reactions in the body, but sometimes it's not so good you know, if you think about it, it would be nice to be able to just go out and graze occasionally instead of having to, you know, go home and cook dinner. It might be easier. Now, the reason they're very specific is because they have um, unique or very specific three-dimensional structures. You want me to go back for a second? So one of the things that we're going to learn is that the reason they're unique, or the reason they only catalyze one reaction is because the shape that they have, the way the molecule moves or flexes, or the shape of the pocket that that molecule interacts with, an, um, or that enzyme reacts with a molecule, is very specific. And so the actual shape of those enzymes is the most important part. And that's why, for instance, you know, we focused in and studied you know, that idea of secondary and tertiary structure. Because it's that secondary and tertiary structure in the previous chapter that is responsible for that specific shape of those enzymes. And so things like hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, disulfide bonds, hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions are all very important to produce that three-dimensional structure. And 
If we take a look at it, we can also categorize some of these things. For instance, they have special terms for this in biology. They use the word apoenzyme to describe the protein part of an enzyme. And then quite often, an apoenzyme may require either a coenzyme or an activator. And the difference between a coenzyme and an activator is simply what biologists define them. What they really are is there's something that's required for an enzyme to function. And if that something required for the enzyme to function is organic, but not protein, then they call that a coenzyme. And an example of that is things like vitamins. One of the reasons that vitamins are highly crucial to your body is because your body can't synthesize some of them. And because they're required to work with a enzyme in order to catalyze a chemical reaction. And so if you don't have enough of that protein avail or that vitamin available, you don't catalyze that reaction to the extent that you need to. And then, like I said, the only difference between a coenzyme and what we would consider an activator is an activator is considered a, or a non-organic, non-organic, which really means that it's a metal ion normally. So things like, you know, we need zinc in our body, we need calcium in our body, we need iron in our body, and so on. Those are because for those enzymes to function, you have to have that other part. And then if we kind of smash those things together, we get what's considered a holoenzyme. And so that's basically an apo plus a co. And technically, they only define it as an apo plus a coenzyme. But you know, that's biologists. I don't see why they make a big difference if it's organic or metallic that's what's added. And so I'm happy if either one of them kind of work. Let's see. Uh, we should probably mention just a little bit of background. This is one of the things that, this is like just a tiny little bit of history. The reason I like to mention it is because the people involved, I mean, they're people's names that you know. For instance, there used to be a big debate whether it was required to have a living organism versus sort of inorganic. And it used to be thought that in order for an enzyme to function, you had to have a living organism. And the person to first kind of study that was Louis Pasteur. And of course, what he studied was how glucose, glucose is fermented to form what? Alcohol. So basically, he studied beer. And we also know that Louis Pasteur is famous for a lot of other things, pasteurization process, et cetera. The other person you may not have heard of his name because we don't use it. And what is his first name? I don't even have it written down. Oh, Edward Buchner. And he's German, so I think he gets a couple, what do they call those little dots? Umlauts or something on top of his U. And he basically was the first person to prove that enzymes functioned outside a living cell. And so he received the 1907 Nobel Prize for that research, or for proving that point. I kind of find it funny sometimes. I mean, if you went back in time and some guy told you, yeah, enzymes, they only require living organisms, you'd look at him and be like, no, you can just, you don't need a living organism. And you know, by proving that back then, you get a Nobel Prize. By saying it today in class, you get a point on the test, maybe, if that's a test question. So what used to be worthy of a Nobel Prize, you guys are now required to just kind of know as a fact. Kind of interesting, huh? Same thing with, like, stereoisomers. I mean, when we covered that chapter, you could have gotten a Nobel Prize for figuring out the existence of stereoisomers. Today, we just say, oh, yeah, guess what? That's a fact. So you guys have lots of Nobel Prize information in your head at one time or another. Now, of course, proving it is usually the hard part. So maybe you know, we're kind of exaggerating that. 
Um, the other reason I like Buchner is because there's Buchner funnels. So he got a funnel named after him or a filter flask named after him. We don't use Buchner funnels in class because we don't have vacuum filtration systems. Uh, hopefully in our new lab, that's one of those things that I'm planning on getting. You know how you had to sit around all day waiting for your uh, filtrations to occur? Yeah, you can do them with a filter flask in about, you know, 10 seconds. And there's a lot of labs we don't do actually because you would have to do multiple filtrations and so, you know, that would take you days to do or at least hours and you would sit around doing nothing and twi but twiddling your thumbs in between. So, just a tiny little history, uh, you know, Pasteur versus Buchner, I guess. Um, I'm going to label this under the miscellaneous category. I can never figure out where to put this in my notes. It's something you guys already know. What's a substrate? Yeah, it's a reactant that is catalyzed by an enzyme, right? That's kind of an awkward way to phrase it. But yeah, they have basically a special name in biology when they're dealing with things that have enzymes. And so they're always talking about how an enzyme acts on a substrate. Well, we could probably say how an enzyme acts on a reactant and be just as logical. Why the biologists have to come up with a separate name for reactants and products, I don't freaking know. I really should ask Todd this question. I should be like, dude, what is up? Can't you use like simple chemistry words? And then the other one that's kind of on that miscellaneous category is what ending does enzymes normally end in? Yeah, enzymes have an ASE ending. And they usually are whatever the substrate is. So for instance, maltase is an enzyme that reacts, or I shouldn't re say reacts with, but interacts with or catalyzes the breakdown of maltase. What would glucase do then? Yeah, break down glucose. And they can even get better than that. And one of the things you'll see is I'm never going to ask you to memorize the name of a specific enzyme. What I would expect you to do is that if you saw a chemical reaction and you saw the enzyme listed on top of the arrow and the enzyme name described what happened, like, you know, something um, six prime phosphate kinase or something like that, you'd look at it and go, oh, yeah, six prime phosphate kinase adds a phosphate group on the number six carbon. You know, things like that. I would expect functionality, but would I expect you to memorize what specific enzyme catalyzes a specific reaction? No, that's just too much. Okay, there are six types of enzymes, or six classifications of enzymes. And you should have a passing familiarity with what each kind of class does. Because of them, let me see, I, I'm going to say five out of the six we're actually going to encounter when we start looking at biological or biochemical pathways. And they're all kind of things you're familiar with. They're just kind of funky takes on how the words work. So the first one is oxidoreductase, oxidoreductase. And what type of reactions do you think that those catalyze? I know this is a stretch. This is going way out on a limb, but what do you think? Reactions? No, what? Oh, yeah, oxidations and reductions. I thought you said reactions. I'm going like, yeah. So, yes, they catalyze oxidation or reduction reactions. And sometimes you'll see them called other things. For instance, you might see it simply referred to as an oxidase or a reductase. And then the other one that we'll actually see is called a dehydrogenase, dehyd ugh, dehydrogenase. Genase. And that's responsible for removing two hydrogens and leading to a carbon-carbon double bond. So it's a special type of a reduction, but it's specific to removing hydrogens and forming double bonds. And so if we, what? This is the opposite of addition, right? This would be elimination. So yeah, if we were a chemist, we'd have said that this is an elimination reaction. That's one of the annoying things you're going to find when I get to the biological pathways section. We start tossing names at different steps in a reaction. And sometimes a reaction can be called two or three or five different things, depending on if you're a chemist, a biologist, or whether or how you want to you know, claim it. And so you have to be kind of flexible with that. 
So oxidations and reductions, that's pretty common, something we're going to see a lot. There is transferases. Can you take a stab at what it does based on its name? Yeah, it transfers functional groups. Have you guys had this before? Or is it just this logical? This is one of those topics I think is kind of, it's like, you know, if all of chemistry and science were taking logical words like this and doing things with them and calling them the logical names, it might actually be easier and make more sense. For instance, we can have, so I guess, yeah, here's some examples. Here's some examples. We can have transaminase, which would be basically, oops, not remove, but transfer an amine group. Or there's a whole family of things called kinases, which lead to transfer of phosphate groups, so PO4 groups. And one of the things we're going to realize is that moving around phosphate groups is one of the ways that your body moves around energy. Or really, if it's trying to get energy from a molecule, what it's doing is it's adding phosphate groups to stress the molecule until eventually you add enough stress to the molecule that you can break it apart. So we're going to see a bunch of transferases when we do things. Here's another going out on a limb one. Hydrolases. And I, I have to be honest, there's only, you really have to kind of memorize these. And luckily to me, the name and what they do so far has been 100%, right? Meaning transferase has the word transfer in it. If you can't remember that that transfers functional groups, I don't know what to do with you. Maybe go get you a McDonald's applications or something. I don't know. What do you think a hydrolase does? What? Yeah, it catalyzes hydrolysis reactions. Now, I can also see where it would be easy to talk about this doing stuff with hydrogen, because the word hydrogen and hydro and things like that is kind of overused and things like that. Uh, we will see these, for instance, we know that when we do hydrolysis type reactions, that uh, we can use, like for instance, a protease. That does it specifically between peptide units, peptide bonds. And we can do lipases. Those are specific to the ester bond. And lipids. Now, I don't expect you to memorize all these. Um, there's phosphatases. And that's the um, phosphate ester bond. And then there's nucleases. Nuclease, whatever, I don't really care about the spelling. That does it for nucleic acids. What I would really like you to do, and I've always kind of warned you on things like this. Yes, there's six of them. I expect you to know all six. And then it would be good to have one example for each of those six, right? You know, I'm never going to ask a test question that says, list all four types of hydrolases we talked about. It's a legitimate test question. I just won't do it. Instead, what I'll say is, give me an example of where a hydrolase might be used. Or actually, what I tend to do is simply say, you know, uh, what type of enzyme catalyzes the sum reaction that I give you. And so if you can figure out that, oh, the reaction um, transfers an amine group, I know that that's a transferase then, you know, it's kind of an easy built-in question as long as you kind of have the basic six of them memorized. So we've got hydrolases. Uh, I guess we could fit one more on here. Isomerase. What do you think an isomerase does? Yeah, something with isomers. That's pretty good. So basically, it allows the interconversion of stereo and structural isomers. Hmm. 
meaning that if we can rearrange the atoms or if we can shift a bond in an atom to go from one isomer to another, then we can do that. So we can actually use, for instance, isomerase, which is, goes between cis and trans. Or we can use what's called an epimerase, which allows technically the conversion between DNL isomers and other things like that. So we can do all of those sort of interconversions, and we'll see it one biological pathway where when they break the molecule apart, they make two different molecules. And that's okay in a biological reaction to do something like that, but your body doesn't like to duplicate things. So what happens is for one of the molecules, the very next step is an isomerase to make the other molecule. And so there's like a little circle in there where we take a molecule, break it apart, and then make both the halves of that molecule the same so that the biological pathway can continue on. And so that's like something that an isomerase would be used for. We have lysase. And that one, honestly, the name doesn't tell me anything. And I have to be honest, I get this one mixed up. Oh, this is number, what, five? I get this one mixed up with the next one because they both start with L. Number six is a ligase. So what lysase does is it adds or removes groups, a functional group. So it's not like a transferase where it's transferring it between two molecules. This is actually literally adding or removing it. And then this is without hydrolysis. So if we do it by hydrolysis, then we call it a hydrolase. If we do it without it, then we call that um, a lysase. And an example of that that we'll see, for instance, is a carboxylase. Car oops, carboxy. And that adds CO2. And of course, the opposite of that is a decarboxylase. Decarboxylase. That would remove CO2. And we can also have that we'll see as a deaminase. Deaminase. That, of course, adds NH3. Actually, it probably removes. I don't know why I said add in my notes. It's got the word D in front of it. And then the last one is used to uh, link two compounds by breaking an ATP bond or breaking phosphate bonds. Phosphate anhydride, anhydride bonds to be specific. So what this really does is it say, takes ATP and it uses it to form bonds. So it breaks apart an ATP molecule, takes that energy, and uses that to combine two molecules together. And again, I know you guys have taken enough biology classes so you at least know what ATP is. We're going to actually have an entire section of the next chapter talking about specifically ATP. And then, um, I don't know, I, I think it's weird. Like, your book doesn't have, like, ATP and then just this big thing. It scatters all the information about ATP over many chapters. So there's six types of enzymes that I want you to be able to point out when we look at uh, chemical reactions and try to think about what we want to do with them. Let's see. If we're kind of going in order and checking our homework to make sure we hit all the high points. Man, I'm kind of going slow. That's okay. It's good and important to know. Plus, the homework's not in the same order the book is in. I don't know why my notes are in a different order, but I decided to kind of follow the order of the book today for some reason. I don't really know why. So one of the things that we've said is that enzymes speed up chemical reactions. There are actually two other ways to speed up reactions, ways to speed up reactions. 
But what we see is that biologically those ways are not terribly good and so that enzymes are the clear winner. Because the other two ways to speed up a reaction is if we simply increase the concentration of the reactants. That speeds up a reaction. If you want something to happen twice as fast for most chemical reactions in a beaker, if you dump twice as much stuff in, the reaction happens twice as fast. That's not really easy to do with your body. You can't simply eat twice as much. I mean, I guess you can, but it's just not very easy to do it or very economical. And the other way is to simply increase the temperature. Meaning, we do a lot of reactions in chemistry where we simply stick them in boiling water because boiling water is awful convenient. And that speeds up a chemical reaction. And the general rule of thumb is, is anytime you increase the reaction 10 degrees Celsius, that doubles the rate. So if you think about it, when we stick something in boiling water and say, leave it in a boiling water bath for five minutes, well, that's probably about 70 degrees, you know, higher than room temperature. And so we're speeding up that reaction by a huge rate simply by increasing the temperature. It's exactly the same reason why we stick things in a refrigerator. What do we want to do when we put food in a refrigerator? Slow down the reactions that lead to the spoilage of the food, right? And so both of those things are really easy to do in a chemistry lab. It's very easy to stick something in a refrigerator and it's very easy to stick something in a boiling water bath. It's not so easy to do that in your body. I don't know how many of you want to jump in boiling water or crawl in the freezer very often. Maybe in winter, I'd, or not winter, summer, I kind of wouldn't mind crawling in the freezer sometimes when it's hot. And so really for biology, that's the only way that you can speed up a reaction. And the way they speed up a reaction, so how do enzymes speed up a reaction? Well, to do that, we have to kind of understand how energy functions in a reaction. And this is actually going back, if you remember or want to review, all the way back to chapter four is where this is first introduced from last semester. Can anyone even tell me what chapter four was on last semester? That's what I thought. Tell me if this diagram starts to make something that you've seen before. See if this rings a bell. Does this start to look familiar? Yeah, so this is a reaction. A goes to B. And you're correct. In this case, I drew the exothermic version. And do you guys remember what we called the amount of energy that we had to add into the reaction to get it going. Activation. Yeah, activation energy. Now, normally this is one of those topics that's hit in most biology classes too. Has Todd covered this and does he do it in Bio 111 or 112? Does Sarah do it in A and P? Does Todd do it in microbiology? Yeah, you probably have seen this before. And so the activation energy, or you'll see that I abbreviated a lot simply AE, simply is the energy required to start a reaction energy required for a reaction to occur. And so what a catalyst does, or an enzyme, is it changes that reaction pathway. And so here we have a catalyzed, catalyzed activation energy. Can you guess what we abbreviate that? CAE. And it changes. I think you can probably make up whatever an acronym you want. I just am lazy. And like for instance, if I ask you on the homework to label all these things, I say, you know, label this and then I instead of writing out the word catalyze activation energy on a picture which takes up a lot of space, you can just write CAE. And this is of course simply the energy required for a reaction to occur with an enzyme present. So really what catalysts do to lower or speed up reactions is catalysts 
provide an alternative chemical pathway, provide an alternative alternative chemical pathway that is lower in energy. And sometimes you'll see that that rephrased as basically they allow a new oops a new transition state. And what transition state is is it's kind of what happens when we think about a reaction as A goes to a transition state goes to B. That there's some intermediate step that there's not just A and then suddenly magically there's a B. That at some point there's something that occurs to cause A to go to B and there's some intermediate state. And what a transition state says or what catalysts kind of do is they provide a different transition state. One that requires less energy to occur. Uh, boy, I should be able to come up with a good analogy for this off the top of my head. Um, let's see, what would be a good example of an alternative pathway that is lower in energy? Well, say you want to... Going the what? Going the yeah, that would be an example. Like if you're walking between two buildings and taking the sidewalk versus taking the direct route, right? That would be an example of kind of a transition state. It requires less energy, and so you can get between the two buildings faster, right? I was thinking along the lines of breaking things, because I was thinking about breaking molecules apart. You know, if I give you a stick that's pretty thick and beefy to break, right? You know, and said, okay, well, you've got to break that across your knee. Or if I give you a chainsaw, which way do you think is faster? Chainsaw. So, or an ax versus a chainsaw when cutting down a tree. So, you know, a chemist might have to take an ax to a tree and the biologist might say, I'm going to get my enzyme out, which is this chainsaw and cut down the tree lickety split. So, that. You guys ever heard the word lickety split before? I don't know. I think there's funny things like, what does that word really mean? I mean, I know what it means. I'm not sure if it's in the dictionary or not, but it's kind of slang. Now, just for bonus sake, what did we call this right here? The difference in energy, oops, not that one. Went a little far. This difference between the energy in A and B. You guys remember? We call that delta H, or that's the amount of energy released in the reaction. Amount of energy released. in the reaction. And in this case, because B is lower in energy than A, this is an exothermic reaction. And you know, I think it's kind of weird. I don't know why exactly, but every time I've ever seen this picture, they always draw it for uh, exothermic reactions. I don't know why they never draw it for an endothermic reaction. You can actually draw it for endothermic. If I draw an endothermic reaction, let's go back to blue. You want me to go back? Does that orange really look kind of yellow to you guys? Yeah. It's like really orange here. It's like kind of light pumpkin puree orange. But yeah, I notice sometimes the colors I pick on my down here, like the green is kind of light, whereas on this it's a dark green. So there's some differences in color lost. But the yellow is readable at least, right? Okay. So if we have energy, of course, and this is still reaction progress. If we drew this for an endothermic reaction, we'd have something like this, where here's A and B. And notice that here's our activation energy. And do you want me to go back again? If we wanted to do it with catalyzed, then that little hump is lower. And so there's our catalyzed activation energy. And then keeping my colors consistent, the difference between A and B is, again, delta H. But in this case, this is the energy required or added to the reaction.
And of course, we should put somewhere, I don't remember what color I was using. This is an endothermic reaction. And I don't know why they always throw them for, show them for exothermic. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong, or I don't think it really changes anything for endothermic reactions. Um, the concepts are still all the same. And maybe it's because most reactions that we do are, tend to be exothermic, but you know, there's plenty of endothermic reactions, especially when we start looking at energy transfer in your body, especially if you're storing energy, almost all those reactions are actually endothermic, meaning they require energy to be input into the reaction in order for it to occur. And so there's a net loss of energy from the system. Oh, good point. So if you're looking at your homework, that hump is what we will call the transition state. Meaning it's that intermediate state between A and B. And so if we kind of think about it not so much as an energy diagram, we could actually kind of make that same idea by simply saying I've got A going to B, or I can take this pathway A going to B, and this is what we would call the uncatalyzed or the, just the normal activation energy, and this might be the catalyzed activation energy, meaning it's lower in energy than the activation energy, but they both go to make B. There's just more pathways. And maybe, who knows, someone will invent something someday. This is just another way to think about activation energies. What they really are is they're saying there's a lot of different ways to accomplish the same thing. For instance, using uh, Jasmine's analysis, maybe this is the normal, or this is the walkway, right? This is following the sidewalk. This is cutting between buildings or cutting across the lawn. And this would be teleporting or taking an airplane between two things or something, meaning it's the fastest way to get between two points. Maybe it's sprinting and jogging and running. I don't know. I'm not sure that running is lower in energy, though, but it would get you there faster. Let's see. Where are we at? Oh, I guess we can start in on that next topic. There are some stuff we're skipping a little bit in the book. Um, I don't really care so much for calculating reaction rates. Uh, that's simply calculating the slope of a line. I figure that's something you guys can all do, so we wouldn't, wanna, we wouldn't waste any time doing it. There are two important points I want to make about enzyme kinetics. And so kinetics in chemistry is the study of reaction rates. And what we generally find is that there is a maximum reaction rate. Therefore, there is sort of what they call limited catalytic ability. Meaning, you can only make it go so fast. You can't actually, um, you know, increase it sort of an infinite amount. There's sort of like a maximum rate. And the other thing is, is that, the, that um, biologically, and take your pick. We've either evolved or we're created. I don't really care which. I just deal with the facts. I leave all that metaphysical stuff to other people that care more about it. So that biologically, um, we've generally been evolved or created to have enzymes that sort of fun function at optimized rates. Rates or in optim or conditions. And I guess what I'm trying to get across is that, for instance, uh, we often will have more than one enzyme that catalyzes a reaction. And one of them catalyzes it at a slow, steady rate, and one of them will catalyze it at a very quick rate. And depending upon the feedback mechanisms we have, they 
sort of function for different priorities or things like that. An example of that, conditions. And an example of that that you can throw under there would be, for instance, uh, hexokinase versus uh, glucokinase. Glucokinase. What hexokinase does is it's the start of the pathway where we take um, glucose and we use it to provide energy. And this has a high priority at low concentrations of glucose. So remember, those little brackets there, that means concentration, right? So low brackets concentration of glucose. Whereas glucokinase takes glucose and it turns it into glycogen, which is basically storing the energy. And so this has a high priority at high concentrations of glucose. And so what that really means is that if I need energy in my, if I have very little glucose available, the body converts it primarily to energy. If I have a lot of glucose or excess glucose available, then that glucokinase kicks in and it sends it over to storage of energy. And so if you kind of take a look at a graph where this is the concentration of glucose, and this is the rate of reaction. Oops. Oh, don't crash on me now. Oops. Looks like it did. Really, I was going to end with this graph. So you guys have the rest written down so I can crash it and Okay, hold on. I mean, it's on tape, but I know it's kind of annoying to have to load the whole video up to write down one thing. Boy, we were doing so good today, and then it just decided to die. Uh, I used to not tape lectures and just put the PowerPoints up afterwards, but then since PowerPoint crashed so much, the nice thing is is taping it doesn't crash very often. I think what, I've crashed it once this semester for taping. So if we draw that graph again, and this is a figure in your book anyway, this is really just figure 30.5. We're just trying to highlight it or draw your attention to it. So what we're saying is that at low concentrations of glucose, we have most of it being turned into energy. And so this would be the activity level of hexokinase. And that's, remember, the one that's going to produce energy. And then we have glucokinase, and that's going to form that I Ugh. glycogen, and that's storing the energy. And so notice that low concentrations, you know, hexokinase is converting most of it to energy, but that at some plateau, which basically says once your body has enough energy available to it, we don't make more and more of it. We instead convert it to storage. And so one of the things you can do, or one of the reasons they say exercise is good for helping you know, weight gain and things like that, is not simply just you know, if you burn more calories, you have to you know, you store less, but that you ramp up your metabolism to have hexokinase converting most of that straight up to energy instead of your metabolism being so low that it converts most of it to you know, glycogen. And I mean, there's obviously, I, I always want to say for people that exercise and diet and want to do that sort of stuff, that really it's simple.